Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lights Out for Birds webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm your host, Savannah Jordan, and I'm a wildlife biologist with the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, I coordinate many of our different habitat and education programs for our organization, but birds in particular are very near and dear to my heart. So I'm so happy to be here with some other fellow bird nerds. Our speakers today are Jennifer Tyrell. She's the engagement manager for the South Carolina Audubon. Jake Heck, he is our industry habitat manager, also with the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. And Amy Tegler, South Carolina Department of Natural Resources bird conservation coordinator. So they're going to be talking all about the dangers that birds face during migration, the issues of light pollution for wildlife, and the steps that we can all take to protect birds and wildlife. So if you have any questions during this webinar, just please type them in the question box and include which speaker your question is for. And we'll answer as many questions as we can after the speakers present. So with that, we'll start with Jen. Take it away, Jen. All right. Uh, well, thank you guys for having me and thank you for joining everyone. Um, looks like we've got 11 participants so far, and I think a few more are going to come filing in. But if you want to go ahead and move forward, Savannah, on the slides, um, I think there's a picture of me, but you can also see me in your camera. So it's a little redundant, um, except my hair is about a foot shorter back then. That was pre-COVID. <laughs> um, I am holding one of my favorite birds. Uh, a lot of people think painted bunning must be my favorite, but I prefer the indigo. I just think they're really pretty. Um, all right, if we wanna go ahead and get started on the next slide, um, I'm gonna be talking to you mostly about bird migration um, and we'll get into some of the hazards of migration, how migration works, and then we're gonna be moving into how, um, oops, sorry, that phone went off, um, how that uh, kind of impacts, oops, <laughs> I think we lost the the slideshow here. Um, and we're going to talk about what hazards birds face and how light impacts uh, bird migration and a lot of other things. So we'll start here with the birds only information. Next slide, please. There we go. So this is a really cool animation that um, is kind of like a preview from the Bird Migration Explorer, which we're going to see a little bit more from in a minute here, but each dot represents uh, kind of like the collective movement of a species. And so these are all species that have been tracked either through um, satellite tags, uh, through eBird and community science information, reporting your uh, bird sightings. And then also um, I think the geolocators and uh, nano tags through the MODIS network, all those things combined into this really cool one-stop shop of uh, migration information. So you can see birds move across our hemisphere all generally around the same time. And you can tell there are some areas where a lot of species will funnel through together, making it really high traffic areas for migration. And those are some of the more dangerous places that they travel through. All right, I could just be mesmerized like that all day, but we're gonna talk about why birds migrate. So this poor little hummingbird obviously decided to stick around during the winter time. Many of our bird species eat insects. 90% of land birds eat insects to feed their chicks um, and then also to get protein sources. So even things like cardinals and chickadees, they eat a lot of insects, caterpillars mostly. Um, and during our winter time here in North America, we don't usually have a lot of insects. So a lot of them pack up, go south. Uh, for the winter it, to avoid weather like this, like that poor little hummingbird. All right, next. Uh, insects, like I mentioned before, this is a prothonotary warbler. They are a neotropical migrant, which means they go to Central and South America. Uh, we have a lot of these at Bidler Forest, and it's one of the birds I personally study with Audubon. Um, this guy has a spider and a caterpillar, or two caterpillars, in its beak and it uh, lives in the swamps, eats tons of bugs. And then um, through some tracking information uh, and research that we've done, we found out almost all the prothonotary warblers in North America all hang out together in the winter in Colombia, South America. So it's pretty incredible the journey that they make. Um, we don't know too many details about how exactly they get there, when exactly they're leaving, what their stopover locations are. But this, uh, this spring, we're gonna be working on that. We're gonna put on 
cutting edge technology trackers on them to hopefully find out a lot more detailed information. So that's really exciting and coming up. So stay tuned for that <laughs> talk later on. All right, next one. This is the Bird Migration Explorer that Audubon and a bunch of partners you can see listed at the bottom there have put together. And it's a really incredible website. Um, only get on there if you've got some time because you can get, you know, going down rabbit holes, checking out all the different information. You can look at each bird species, specific tracked individuals. And what you see there is highlighted at one track of an osprey, but each of those tiny faint little lines is one individual bird that's been tracked. So you can get all sorts of cool information. And then you all also can look at um, the threats that they face in their journey uh, and then also look at connections. So you can click on a bird that's been spotted in Columbia, South America, and then see all the other places that individual has been tracked and picked up through the MODIS network or, you know, other means or banding stations. So really, really cool. A great way to learn a lot more about migration and the issues that birds face. Next. All right, so first we're gonna talk about raptors. Raptors have some interesting ways that they migrate. The big thing about them though to keep in mind is that they migrate during the day. So a lot of our other birds actually migrate at night and it's to avoid them because <laughs> raptors eat birds, especially like Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks, merlins, American kestrels. They'll eat songbirds, no problem. Uh, so they migrate during the day. All the songbirds avoid them and migrate at night. Next slide. So how hawks and um, other raptors like to migrate is by using like a free ride. They find thermals or rising columns of air um, in the atmosphere to ride it up like an elevator and they go to the top of the thermal and then they're so they'll soar down to the next one. Um, so a lot of people see circling vultures and often think, oh, there must be something dead on the ground. But really, they're just taking advantage of the free free ride to gain altitude to then move. So some birds like this can move hundreds of miles without ever having to flap their wings. It's uh, a pretty efficient and incredible way to migrate. So raptors take advantage of this daytime thermal network. Uh, songbirds just power through and um, spend a lot of energy flying to get through the night. Next slide. In more mountainous regions, you will get kind of clusters or bottlenecks of migrants. And so mountainous regions can be um, kind of higher danger zones and uh, just a, a denser migrant path um, than other places. Like the Piedmont, you don't get quite as many birds um, funneling through there in big numbers, but you get up to the ridges of the Appalachians and you have a lot of birds moving through because they take advantage of wind sources um, to help power their flight. So this is called convergent lifting. Wind moves across a landscape, hits a mountain and goes up. And again, they use it like a free elevator ride or a tailwind. So you'll see a lot of birds there, but raptors often take advantage of this. And a great place to see this in South Carolina is uh, Caesars Head State Park. It's in the upstate. It's a lovely lookout and tons of raptors move through during peak migration days. So very fun and exciting to go watch. Next. So we talked about raptors during the day. Now we're going to talk about songbirds at night. Um, a fun little fact about this slide uh, specifically, if you look either during September and October on a full moon and it's a clear night and you have some north winds, um, if you watch the moon through your binoculars, sometimes you can see birds moving across like the little silhouettes of them flying through the night. So that's kind of fun. It's called moon watching. Next slide. So birds migrate through the night using a number of different um, tactics, depending on the species. Some of them use celestial cues. So look at um, different uh, co uh, constellations. Those were what I was looking for. Constellations and planets and things like that to orient themselves in the right direction. And they've actually tested this by putting migratory birds in a planetarium and showing them the right constellations to see if they change their orientation depending on what time of year it was. Pretty cool. Next slide. Um, they'll also use the sun's position. Uh, when the sun sets and rises, an hour before and after sunrise and sunset, there is a beam of polarized light that shoots up from the horizon that birds are able to see. And so they're able to orient themselves and figure out where they are based on the sun's position at sunrise and sunset. And a lot of birds will actually experience um, what's called Zuganru. It's a fun new word you can use at a cocktail party to impress people. But Zuganru means um, rest nighttime migration restlessness and so when birds know it's going to be time to move and you know you got to migrate the 
conditions are right. It's the right time of year. Um, around this time when they're seeing the sun setting and rising is when they kind of get that uh, restlessness to get moving. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned the polarized uh, light at sunrise and sunset. So that's a big part of it. Next slide. They also have geomagnetic receptors in their eyes, almost built in like a, a rod or a cone in our eyes where they can actually see and sense the earth's magnetic field and the lines of the magnetic field on the on the ground. So following it almost like a roadmap. Um, so they can see and sense even more than we can, um, which is pretty incredible because I get lost sometimes going to the office if I'm not paying attention. But these guys can migrate thousands of miles and come back to the exact same spot a year later. It just, it's mind boggling. All right, next slide. Um, so when birds are migrating, depending on the species, a lot of them take uh, really long flights. And to be able to do that, they have to stop and refuel and eat a whole bunch, gain some weight, put on some fat, and then, then they take off flying again. And one of the really good examples of this are red knots and horseshoe crabs. The um, horseshoe crabs spawn, they lay eggs in the sand during certain times of year, the red knot migration is timed with that so that they show up just as that spawning is happening so they can eat a bunch of horseshoe crab eggs, refuel, and then head back up to the Arctic or heading to, you know, uh, South America, the other pole um, for wintering season. So red knots are a really important bird we pay attention to. They've declined a lot. And so this is one bird we um, really try and help out. Next slide. A lot of songbirds use uh, native plants to refuel themselves. So when they have good sapover habitat, it's usually full of native plants. And in the fall, there's a lot of berries, like uh, this berry here is beautyberry. It's a great landscaping plant. Pokeweed, um, a different uh, dogwood is a really good one too. Magnolia fruits, um, a lot of that stuff is timed with their fall migration. So if you wanna help uh, migrating birds, plant native plants in your yard, and try and protect areas in your community that might be good stopover habitat. Next slide. Uh, so you can see that this this little thrush is eating. Um, I believe those are that might be spice bush. Well, I should have looked that up, but <laughs> that's not a plant I have in my yard, so I'm not as familiar with it. But energy rich berries can make the difference of getting to your final destination or not. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happens when it's or not. Um, in a few minutes. Next slide. So some of the migration champions, uh, the really cool, big number, impressive stats. One is a bar-tailed godwit, and this bird broke its own record, and I had to update the numbers on the slide. This species has, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, been documented at flying 8,425 miles nonstop in one flight without landing. Um, they use satellite or cell tags to track these birds. And this one flew all the way across the Pacific Ocean in one shot, um, 11 straight days without landing. Um, I can't even try and compare that to a human feat. It's not possible. Um, while they're making these long flights, if they don't have enough food stored up from those stopover locations like the red knots and the horseshoe crabs, as soon as they go through their fat stores, they start to digest their own muscles and brain tissue and organs and they just get skinnier and skinnier and make it or not. So pretty impressive. Next one. Um, the longest round trip annually would be the Arctic turn. So Arctic, they go pole to pole. Um, they do a 44,000 miles round trip annually. And in the lifetime of a, a good, well-lived bird, about 30 years old for an Arctic turn, they can travel 1.5 million miles which is insane. And that's about the distance, I think, to the moon and back. So they call them the moon bird, uh, which is pretty fun. All right, next one. The highest flight ever recorded was from a Rappel's griffin vulture, and he was documented at 40,000 feet of altitude. And you think, wow, how did you figure that out? Or how did they find out that that was that bird? Unfortunately, it got sucked into a jet engine, and so they took the remains of what was left of that bird, did genetic testing and found out at that altitude when they hit that bird, that is what went through the jet engine. So uh, a crummy way to figure it out, but a really impressive feat. Birds can go up that high. Next uh, next slide. Uh, Bar-tailed goose. Um, those guys will migrate over the peak of Mount Everest 
like on a regular basis no big deal just twenty nine thousand feet in a flock of birds um it's just incredible what they are capable of and birds actually have a lot of different um adaptations to help them store um, oxygen in their blood uh, have it you know stay in even in low oxygen environments the way that they breathe they don't have just two regular lungs they have a series of air sacs that constantly are moving air in and out um, even if you're exhaling the bird still has air moving into another air sac it's very complicated but just know that they're well equipped for low oxygen environments and migrating at high altitudes like this next slide all right, and then the snow goose, that's one of the more impressive uh, migrations. They get into huge, huge groups. Uh, I think folks in the Midwest are probably more familiar and out West uh, with this type of migration. We occasionally get snow geese showing up on the coast and in South Carolina, but not in numbers like this. So something really impressive to go see. Next slide. Um, one of the perils that they face is the open ocean crossings. This is a short-eared owl. And it is currently pictured on my uncle's fishing boat. He was out in uh, the Pacific Ocean in Alaska. This bird was disoriented and lost. Who knows what happened, but he ended up landing on his fishing boat um, and got taken to a rehab center. So next slide. Um, so that bird did survive. They actually flew him down to his uh, wintering grounds on a private flight. So he got to cheat during migration, but he made it. And it's, you know, just goes to show what they go through and how dangerous migration is for birds. So dangerous that when they're flying over the Gulf of Mexico or big stretches of water or a storm takes them further out to sea than they anticipated, if they don't have enough energy to get back to land, they will fall in the water and into the belly of a shark many times. Um, they were doing a study on sharks in the Gulf of Mexico, looking at stomach contents. And these are the different types of birds that they found inside shark bellies. And you can see during uh, the time of year, it's very much keyed up with migration times. So pretty wild to think one of the predators of our backyard birds that we think of is a shark. <laughs> All right, next slide. The other big thing is running into stuff in the dark. Birds have evolved with nothing else in the sky uh, for millions of years until we came along and started putting up skyscrapers, guy wires, buildings, you know, all those things. Um, and so now, unfortunately, they end up getting disoriented. They run into things not knowing that they're there. Um, this is an imprint of a bird um, on a uh, skyway bridge. So like a little walkway over a road that has glass on either side. Um, this was more of a daytime collision, and that's a whole nother issue, but I want to show you the, you know, what the impacts look like when a bird does hit the window. You'll see a faint outline, and that is actually created from a feather called powder down. It's a feather that breaks apart and is used for preening and keeping their feathers in good condition, but it makes a perfect silhouette and outline of a bird when they hit the window, which is really sad. Um, next slide. And... About, so in one year, 365 to 988 million birds die annually from collisions, and that can include daytime collisions and nighttime collisions. Daytime collisions are, there's an issue with reflectivity in the, in the glass, birds don't see it, they run into it, um, but the rest of it is nocturnally when they're migrating at night. 56% um, of window collisions are low-rise buildings, so shorter buildings, not just skyscrapers. I mean, the skyscrapers do have a higher mortality rate because when the birds do run into them, it's usually a lot of them in one place. But as far as the full percentage goes, um, low rise buildings is 56% and then residential homes is 44%. So there's a lot of work that we can do in our communities and in our homes to help protect birds from running into the windows at night. Um, and then, of course, skyscrapers have their own issues, but we can all make a difference. So I believe that is my last slide, and I think I'm going to hand it over to Jay next. Oh, nope, just kidding. <laughs> Lights out is what we want to talk about, but um, the dead birds on this table are all from a, a one night on a building in Galveston, Texas. Um, so it's pretty insane how much an impact you know, these buildings and light pollution can have on bird populations. All right. And with that, I think I am now handing, handing it over to Jay. There you go. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, okay. My name is Jay Keck and I'm the industry habitat manager for the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. And, uh, you know, a bird changed my life. It was actually two birds and one I think is, is favored. I think Jennifer said she likes the indigo bunning better than the, uh, 
painted bunting. And I have to agree, I, I always am a little hesitant to um, to admit that whenever I'm with some people in the coastal plain of South Carolina that have painted buntings. But um, that's one of the birds that changed my life and uh, connected me to this amazing planet uh, even deeper than I already was connected, you know, as a as an outdoorsman, you know, through hunting and fishing. Um, I also wrote down the word Zuganru, and I'm not going to tell you how to how I spelled it, but um, it'll I'll Google it afterwards because uh, that is one of the coolest words ever. But um, yeah, today today even though I'm a I'm a bird guy, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple birds, but I'm going to tell you um, how light pollution um, or they call it Allen um, artificial light at night um, affects you know some of the some of the other critters that are out there, and a lot of these other animals that I'll talk about, you know, are, are some of the animals that that feed our birds. Um, so we'll go to the to the next uh, slide, Savannah. Um, and one thing that I learned is that there's a lot more research that that needs to come out. You know, this this satellite um, imagery picture on the right hand side, I think, was taken around 2016. Um, you know, they they found that whatever imagery that they were using really showed well the uh, the effects of light pollution all around the globe. And you can go to the, the website there and and there's a lot of things um, that I'll be talking about, a lot of information, and I'll give you resources at the end of the um, the, the webinar or in an email uh, so y'all can you know do some research uh, for yourself be because there's just so much information. Uh, but information is continually coming in. Um, you think about the first uh, town based on what I read, uh, the first city was outfitted with LEDs. Um, I think it, it's there it was 2006, but even if it was in the year 2000, you know, in geological times, I mean, that's that's a blink of an eye, right? Um, so we're just starting to to get a ton of this information in and learning more and more about it. Um, one thing that I just you know kind of wanted y'all to think about, you know, I was born and raised in South Carolina. I used to sit on the south side of Lake Murray on a, on our dock with my with my dad quite a bit and we'd watch meteors and uh you know one of my favorite things that we could see were uh, was the uh, milky way and uh you know I have two boys one's 13 and one's 9 and we've never seen the milky way and I live now on the north side of of Lake Murray and that's something that I don't get to you know experience with them um and that'll always be a memory that I have with my dad so you know I don't know that makes me happy and I'm I'm just wondering you know how many people aren't you know, able to experience that right now with friends and family um, or just themselves, you know, think about Van Gogh. Would we have Starry Night, you know, one of his most famous paintings if he was born in the 2000s um, or in the 1980s or so? Um, so just something to kind of think about. And, um, you know, Noah did a, uh, the, give me a second, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, did a study and they um, estimated that 80% of Americans um, will not be able to see or cannot see the Milky Way due to light pollution. And they estimate around a third of the global population uh, can't see the Milky Way. So just, you know, from a from an inspirational standpoint and, a, you know, creativity, think about all the creativity and inspiration that's not happening because of the night sky that we cannot see anymore. Um, you can go to the next one. Um, so, you know, based on the research that I did, it seems uh, a few, um, you know, uh, there's a few effects of artificial light on wildlife. And this comes from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, light attracts organisms, and that can be bad. It can, uh, you know, increase predation uh, upon those, those animals. Um, you know, it can exhaust them, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it repels some uh, animals. Um, we'll talk about the, um, you know, large predatory cats a little bit, um, some bat species, uh, even, you know, uh, birds like whippoorwills that that try to avoid as best that they can, you know, artificial light as they as they migrate. And then uh, finally, the, it alters the day and night patterns. Um, they might not get enough sleep. Um, it can alter reproductive cycles. And, um, you know, that... Uh, um, melatonin is a, is a powerful, you know, thing that we produce. And if we're not producing it at night, um, you know, our body can't oftentimes repair itself the way it should. And, you know, I just love these, these pictures here. Um, and, you know, think about the things, the animals, the organisms that are being affected by artificial light at night, you know, um, think about the beetles and the malls and the damselflies and dragonflies, and, you know, they're eaten by frogs. Um, they're eaten by other things too. And then you've got this beautiful green heron that's eating a green tree frog, um, you know, and then that green heron, I don't know if it's going to be predated upon by another bird, maybe, 
Uh, it'd have to be a big one, but um, you know, the, the, the juveniles and the, and the young, you know, they're food for other animals. So, you know, it's, it affects everything or so many organisms out there. Um, just kind of something that I want y'all to think about. All right, we can go to the next one. Another thing that I, that I used to see as a child, um, I mean, I used to catch jars of, of these um, and, you know, you, you read about you know, uh, the decline, um, or at least, at least the perceived decline of fireflies. And you read about, you know, folks saying the same thing, um, grandparents ca catching, you know, and filling up jars with fireflies, you know, I'm 45 years old and I remember that, but that is definitely something that my kids, um, have never had the opportunity to do. And they grow up in the same state, you know, about 10, 15 miles from where I grew up. Um, you know, you think about, it's not just, you know, uh, light pollution that's affecting them, but habitat loss, um, degradation, uh, alteration, you know, to their landscape, um, pesticides, even native plants, you know, um, uh, fireflies or lightning bugs, you know, they, they eat pollen, they eat nectar, um, sometimes they eat each other. Um, and if we're, you know, installing plants, you know, from Japan and Asia and Australia, because we think they look pretty, um, they might not be able to feed upon those. Um, so just uh, one more thing to, to think about as you're, you know, kind of developing your, your habitat and your, your, your yard, um, you know, are you doing it with uh, nature's best interest in mind? Um, but according to the Xerces Society, more than three quarters of firefly species in the United States and Canada are nocturnal or crepuscular. So you know, the effect of um, artificial light at night can be significant for these. And um, scientists have done studies that showed um, some of the fireflies, which they, you know, they they uh, illuminate to communicate, you know, uh, the males oftentimes will fly um, and then pulse that, that light and uh, the female will be either on low vegetation or um, on the ground and she'll respond and then, you know, um, then they mate. Well, hopefully they do. Um, and studies have shown that the, the males will either stop completely, um, you know, pulsing or they will, uh, just slow down. Um, they've also found that places, even with, um, you know, yellow or orange lights can kind of drown out or wash out the yellowish kind of orange glow, um, of that firefly affecting, um, uh, their reproduction in, uh, negatively. Um, and again, I'll, I'll send a, a link uh, to everybody so y'all can look into that a little bit deeper. We can go to the next one. I think this one's probably been studied um, the most. Um, and it's a it's a relatively easy concept to, to get. Um, I just kind of imagine, you know, being alive 200 years ago and being at the ocean and just imagine what you would see, you know, if it's even a half moon, um, or even no moon at all, you know, the Milky Way is going to be there um, on a clear night, at least illuminating the uh, the sky, um, some stars, some planets, you know, there's a little bit of light trickle that's going to come down, but you're also going to have um, that reflection from the ocean. So, you know, if I'm a baby turtle a couple hundred years ago, that that comes out um, and and begins looking around, the brightest thing that he or she is going to see is going to be the ocean, right, or the ocean side. Um, they would stay away from the darker silhouetted, um, you know, dunes. Um, so they knew that dark was not good and they would go towards the light. Um, obviously now, you know, as this picture kind of um, illustrates, um, the, the ocean isn't the lightest thing anymore. Um, so they'll, you know, become disoriented um, or orient themselves. Um, they're thinking correctly to the brightest light and they will, you know, cross roads and, um, you know, oftentimes die. Um, the numbers, there's a large disparity between the numbers that I found. Um, some, some articles I read and some papers I read, you know, were supported 100,000 100, or hundreds of thousands of sea turtles uh, would, would die because of this. And then I've read, you know, some articles that supported or suggested that millions of sea turtles would die. So I'm hoping that they'll polish up that, the, those numbers um, in the future. Um, but I guess the point is that at least hundreds of thousands of these, you know, die every year because of light pollution. Um, go ahead, Samantha. 
Um, listen, I don't have any any slides with, you know, mentioning jets or, you know, sharks or anything like this, but I do have the dung beetle. All right. And I think dung beetles are awesome. I did more research on dung beetles during this for this presentation than I ever have. <laughs> and I'm glad I did, though. Um, you know, the the that gorgeous, gorgeous rainbow scarab beetle that you see right there, that's one of those that we have right here in our own state. And I and I hope if you if you haven't found one, I hope you get out and uh um, take a closer look and, and, and find one of those. It's, it's always a treat to come up on, on one of those jewels. Um, and hopefully you're not an, alone when you do. Um, that's not one of the ones that, uh, rolls the dung. Um, that is a tunneler. I learned that there's three types of dung beetles. You've got a tunneler. So this one will go through the poo, uh, the dung and just tunnel right below it. Um, they'll create these chambers and store their dung there um to feed on or have their um offspring feed on it um there are ones i think if i'm if i'm correct um they just lay their eggs right in it um and that's you know that's that's the way that that they do it they don't they don't roll and they don't tunnel underneath they just uh, deposit their eggs right right in it and then you have the ones that actually um you know they're, they're called travelers the ones that roll the dung and you can see on the on the graph to the or not the graph, but the illustration on the left hand side, you know, on a dark sky night, you know, with no light pollution, you can see that, you know, there's a central location where the dung is. And then they um, are able to use the Milky Way or the moon or, um, you know, some of the constellations, you know, like Jennifer was talking about earlier about birds, I think, um, to kind of orient themselves and guide them to their destination. And, and they're trying to get away from competition, you know, other dung beetles. And they want to make sure that they uh, get to bury that before that dung um, ball, you know, dries up. You know, they want that that nice and nice and moist, right? Um, you know, even in places where there is light pollution, as long as there are large, um, you know, antennas and and other structures with light, they've actually found that they can they can um, navigate, you know, and and roll that 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 uh, dung away from the central location. So it's it's still okay. Um, I I don't think it's you know optimal, but it, they still I think it sounds like from what I've read that they still get the job done. The problem is when there is that really bad glow um, that we see. I mean I'm in Chapin and I can see on the other side of of Lake Murray to the south, you know where um, Le Lexington is. I can see where Newberry is, and they can see where Chapin is, even though we're a lot smaller. We've got the sky glow, um, and so that's. You know that that glow is what really disorients them. They they can't really see those structures. Um, they can't see the the celestial you know um, uh, things that are out there um, for them to navigate. Um, and then you know there there's again competition. Um, they may not be able to bury it. It may dry out too quickly, and so it really messes them up. And when when you're thinking about beetles. You know, think about everything that eats them. And if they can't reproduce, you know, as as well as they could without light pollution, you know, what else are they affecting? Um, you know, I, I love whippoorwills and I lo love Chuck Will's widows. And if you read about them, I mean, their diet. Uh, listen, I'm, if I can, I'm going to get to this one. I want I want you to to listen to how many uh, beetles the eastern whippoorwill eats. But Let's see, including moths, scarab beetles, uh, click beetles, longhorn grasshoppers, stoneflies, ground beetles, carrion beetles, tiger moths, ants, bees, wasps, fireflies, longhorn beetles, measuring uh, worm moths, owlet moths, weevils, and scavenger beetles. So, you know, I don't think our warblers, as far as I know, are really going after the beetles, but, you know, um, things with really large mouths like, um, you know, our whippoorwills, chuckwills, widows, even, even uh, purple martins will take those beetles. So, um, you know, shut the lights off or, or really reduce, you know, what you have um, and create a log pile and a brush pile and give those beetles something to uh, to breed in and live under um, for, for your birds and on your property and everything else. All right, go ahead. Um, you know, this was totally new, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I just learned it, um, you know, in my research, but you know, habitat loss, it creates habitat loss. So if I'm a, if I'm a little brown bat and I don't want to be predated upon by owls or other birds of prey that kind of like to hang out at artificial light sources, you know, um, you know, during the evening or at night, um, if I'm not going to fly through there, I just lost some of my habitat. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the habitat shrinks, um, you know, I have, I have to potentially work harder for my food, um, if I can find it. 
Uh, so I just thought that was an interesting idea. I read um, an article uh, from the National Wildlife Federation that um, uh, suggested that uh, 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 large cat predators um, uh, do try to avoid as best as they can um, those areas with lights. Um, and then you think back to the whippoorwill um, flying, and this was a paper from a PhD student at the University of Man Manitoba, I believe, from Canada. They put GPS devices on male whippoorwills and followed them down, and they just saw this me meandering uh, pattern um, of their migration. And the the data kind of suggested that they were um, avoiding, you know, cities with a, uh, a too much artificial light, um, you know, at night. So, you know, it's a form of habitat loss, even, and that's a large scale habitat loss, you know, and, and think about the extra miles that those birds might have to uh, navigate in order to um, go around those, those cities with the, the bad light problem. Go ahead. Um, I thought this was really cool. Um, there's a few ways uh, that these, these insects um, and real fast, when we're talking about insects, there's a paper back in 20, 2018, I believe, um, that suggested that 400 to 500 million tons of insects are eaten every year by birds. I think spiders outdo them by maybe one or 200 million tons, you know, um, globally. Um, but when we're talking about insects, I think Jennifer had mentioned that, um, you know, 90% or more of our terrestrial, you know, birds eat insects. Um, the data, you know, from that paper really supports that, you know, think about the thousands, I mean, the, the millions of tons that are being consumed by birds. Um, so when we have these insects, you know, gathering around these lights and they're exhausting themselves or they just crash and, and pass away um, or they're just not fulfilling their ecological, you know, um, uh, action or need, you know, of breeding, you know, uh, finding food, uh, you know, foraging. Um, you know, it can really harm, you know, not just our birds, but wildlife in general. Um, they are eaten by, you know, so many different types of species out there. Um, but I thought this was kind of cool. Like, say, say if this was a light um, and I am a, in a, in a moth and this is my back, you know, I kind of orient my, my, my back around the light. Like, if, and if I was doing it, like the picture suggests um, or illustrates, that's called orbiting. But there's also uh, a way in which they they kind of you know stay around the light, and that's called stalling, where they'll they'll be flying, they see the light, and then they they kind of invert a little bit, and then they just kind of go up, and then they just kind of stall out. And I didn't really see too much information after that, um, so I'm assuming that they uh, just re repetitively do that. Um, and then there's inverting, where they're flying, um, they uh, pass the light. They invert to keep their back, you know, uh, to the light, and then they just go straight down, and then they crash. Oftentimes, um, they crash and then they die. Um, the idea is the reason they do that is, you know, historically before artificial light, they would keep their back to the moon, the stars, the Milky Way, that light, and so they could just kind of fly nice and level, you know, as they kept that, you know, to their back, and they know that the they knew that the Earth was, you know, below them. Um, so that's the best explanation as that I found as to why, um, and that was a, a, a study that was done just recently in the last uh, two or three years, and I'll have that link for y'all too, um, but that was the best explanation as to why insects do that. And we'll go to the next one. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Y'all can, can see the effects of the direct effects and the indirect effects of artificial light on, on insects, um, whether that's a, an adult, a larva, or even the pupa. Um, and I'll, again, have the link for this, but direct effects, activity suppressed, feeding suppressed, distracted you know, by the light, so wasting a lot of time probably and not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, direct mortality, you know, the, that when they invert and they, they, uh, they crash down, um, oftentimes it's, it, it's fatal. Um, Population fragmentation, you know, again, habitat loss, um, population reduced, uh, feeding suppressed again for the larva, um, and then reduced uh, body mass, I've, I've found evidence of. Um, and then, you know, the, the study on the right-hand side at the bottom 
uh, suggesting that 60% of invertebrates are uh, nocturnal and then including uh, 75 to 85% of our moths and butterflies. So it's a, it can affect a significant amount of our insects. All right, go ahead. And I just, I never thought that that this was a thing until I started researching, but you know, you can see directly the effects of, of artificial light on plants. And you can see that, I don't know if that's a sumac or not, but it looks like it to me, it could be something else, but you can see where it's turning red and then you can see where the light is and the leaves are green. So the, the idea um, that um, scientists have that affect, um, you know, insects negatively is that, you know, there could be caterpillars, um, leaf miners, uh, which are little teeny caterpillars, other insects that are staying on these leaves way too long. Then winter rolls in, they're still on there. Um, they haven't done their, you know, seasonal duties. Um, and there could be a lot of mortality there. Um, and it increases predation um, also. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of negative effects um, with street lights on the actual plants that also affects the um the insects that you know predate or use them so go ahead and listen i'd like to be healthier i'm 45 i would love to be the healthiest you know jkeck as possible um and you know we're, we're we're living in a world where it makes that really really you know, tough. And this is just one that I've really never thought of, you know, bef before the last, you know, few years um, of beginning to learn about this um, and listening to podcasts. And, um, you know, I'm just going to read some of the, the things that uh, it can lead to, but sleep deprivation, um, stress, anxiety, fatigue, it says uh, suppressing melatonin, which is known to be a powerful antioxidant, is thought to lead to cellular damage and some cancers. Um, when we disrupt our circadian rhythm, um, it can increase our obesity, diabetes, um, and mood disorders. So, uh, you know, please do your own research, um, you know, listen to a good podcast, uh, read, and um, I don't know, you know, let's help wildlife out, but I think we can really help ourselves out too. And then next slide is my last one, I believe. You know, I I've gone to Costa Rica four times in the last couple of years, and every time I come back, my my wife, if I didn't go with her, um, my wife, uh, you know, tells me that I need to stop, you know, being in my Costa Rica chill. And listen, I just came from a from a beautiful place, so I'm all happy. Um, but I would say one of the things why I'm so relaxed is that I go to sleep at night when I'm supposed to. Um, yeah, I'm tired from hiking and 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 looking for snakes and and birds and everything. But you know, the places that I've always stayed at have limited, if if any, artificial lights at night. And I, you know, I remember taking a group down there and at 7.30, people are ready to go to bed. You know, they think it's 9.30. Um, and we wake up and we're burning at 5.40 a.m. The clay colored uh, thrush wakes us up and the howler monkeys wake us up. And I don't hear anybody complaining about how tired they are. Um, you know, there's no TVs, there's, there's no tablets out. Um, you know, and, and this green honey creeper right here was taken by my wife's cousin as we were watching, you know, uh, green honey creepers and shining um, honey creepers and red legged honey creepers, you know, feed at all these birds at dusk, or I'm sorry, all these insects at, at dusk by this one pond with with fallen trees in it. And the number of insects and the number of birds was just re remarkable. And there was no artificial light. And listen, is that anecdotal? Yep, absolutely. Um, but it happened. Um, and I can only tell you how I feel, you know, when I'm down there and how quickly <laughs> I don't feel like that whenever I get back up here, I've got my kids, you know, I've got a, I've got a job and I, you know, I'm, I'm doing other things too, but, um, boys, there are a lot of light, um, and, and a lot of other things going on here that, that negatively, negatively affect, in my opinion, you know, wildlife and, and us. So, I appreciate you you listening to me, and um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Amy. Thanks. Um, I'm Amy Tagler. I'm the Bird Conservation Coordinator for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, I guess, you know, I would second everything Jay and Jen said um, about their love of birds. I often get asked, what is your favorite bird? So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And my genuine, honest answer is that I like them all. Like it's really the one I'm looking at, the one I can hear, 
the one that's in my hand at the moment. I, I just, I can't decide. Um, and I was also thinking, you know, as I was listening to them talk, you know, um, about my experiences with birds. And I would say that one of my most striking personal experiences that I've had was early in my career, I was working along the Gulf Coast during spring migration and just going out to the beach and seeing the birds fly over the Gulf of Mexico and just being so exhausted. Like they would literally just fall down to the sand uh, once they got to the land. And it was just really um, striking to me um, the effort these birds have to take, you know, uh, for their migratory journeys. Um, I just, that, that, that's an experience I'll never forget. Um, so anyway, I want to dig right in so um, we don't waste too much time. Um, so I'm going to go through um, some strategies that we can all do to help reduce light pollution. And so we'll send out links through all this. So don't worry about taking notes um, as I'm going through. So what can each of us actually do to help reduce light pollution? Next. So these days, artificial light, it, it's all around us. Uh, so I, I want to start out by explaining what exactly light pollution actually is. Light pollution is essentially misused and wasted light. It's caused by inefficient and poorly designed light fixtures and also leaving lights on unnecessarily. Some of the consequences of light pollution are glare, spill light, light, overlighting, and sky glow. The image on the right shows an example of spill light. It's light from a source into unintended areas. It's most often noticed when it comes into like your neighbor's window or onto another property. Next. Glare is bright light that results in reduced visibility. It's often caused by horizontal light. The top picture shows examples of a light fixture with a design that creates glare on the right um, and a design without glare on the left. And that's because it directs the light downwards. One result of glare is night blindness, actually. The two photos at the bottom show how visibility can actually increase when light fixtures are designed appropriately. And glare is a present. Next. Overlighting and sky glow are probably what most people actually think about when they hear light pollution. Overlighting is illumination that is brighter than what is required for humans to see. And sky glow is the illumination of the sky above, off the scene above cities. Bigger cities tend to produce more artificial light, so that's what people tend to think about, but small towns are actually also have, can have uh, quite a substantial impact to migratory birds because those areas tend to be closer to the wildlife habitat. I actually took this photo a few weeks ago um, in an airplane and it just really struck me. Um, if I was a bird flying through the sky and I didn't understand what artificial light was or really, really what a star is either, I could see how this could be really confusing and how I, a bird can be disoriented uh, when, they, when they see something like that. Next. So light pollution comes from both residential and non-residential areas. Some widespread sources of light pollution include interior lights, exterior security lighting, landscape lighting, and vanity and architectural lights. Non-residential light sources include things like adver advertising fixtures, street lights, lights at sporting facilities, parking lots, and also sometimes festival lighting. Next. So sometimes people think that light pollution is just this big problem and it's not, and there's not really anything that they can do individually to help. So um, I'm gonna go through a few things because um, there actually are things that everybody can do even at their own house. So for interior lighting, you can reduce light spill from your windows by turning off interior lights when they aren't being used. And of course, this can be done manually, but there's also things like timers that can be done uh, to automatically turn lights off. For the interior lights that need to be on, just simply close your curtains, your blinds, or your shades, and that also helps reduce the light pollution. Next. So there are also several things that can be done to reduce artificial light pollution for exterior lights. One of the best things that is to use light fixtures that direct light downwards. And uh, in the top image, you can see how different light fixture styles can impact where the light actually goes. All the light going upward is essentially unnecessarily wasted light, even the horizontal light. Uh, an added bonus is that downward directed light, like what's labeled best in this top image, also reduces glare and can also increase visibility. Lighting should also be placed as low to the ground as possible. Um, and it should be um, only placed in areas where it's 
actually needed for the light with the light being directed only in the, in the specific areas. The bottom picture, for example, shows an example where lighting was placed near the ground and only illuminating the walkway. And it doesn't necessarily um, illuminate the sky. And even the lights higher, a little further away into the walkway, are shield down shielded because of the ceiling. Next. So here are some examples of what down shielded lighting fixtures um, actually look like. On the left are ineffective light fixtures, or I mean, sorry, um, are the bird friendly light fixtures, and on the right are the ineffective light fixtures. Um, and if you're not, if you're trying to figure out, uh, going back at the store, trying to figure out which light fixtures are effective in Dubai, you can look to see if they're dark sky certified. Um, and that's one way to, to help figure that out. So I'll give you a few seconds to look at this. Um, so many exterior lights are for security purposes. Uh, but I just wanted to do a quick note that uh, security lighting must be carefully designed to be effective. Increased lighting does not necessarily result in greater security. And that's due to the glare that I mentioned and also blind spots from shadows that can be created. All right, next. The color of the light can also be, um, can also affect birds and other wildlife. Warmer colored lights, the amber or reddish tints are less harmful to birds, while the blue and the white shaded lights tend to have a greater negative impact um, because it's more likely obscures the stars like they had talked about before that are used for navigation. When you buy lights, bulbs that are less than 3000 kelvins, like on, on the label, are the warmer tones. And nowadays, LEDs are effective at projecting light across that whole color spectrum. Um, and also, lights should also be as dim as possible. They only need to be bright enough for people to see. Anything brighter than that is essentially just wasted light. Next. One of the most impactful things that a person can do is to only use exterior lights when they're needed. It is especially important to reduce exterior lights during spring and fall when birds are migrating. Ideally, exterior lights would be turned off from March through May and August through October from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. while birds are more likely to be migrating um, through the night sky. At a minimum, uh, turn off lights on cloudy nights during those periods because the clouds diffuse the lighting, kind of making the lighting situation worse. If lights can't be turned off, one of the easiest ways to reduce the impacts of artificial light is to use lights with motion sensors. Um, another option is to the timers. If lights need to be turned on most of the time, you can set timers so that the lights turn off for maybe like every 30 for 30 minute periods throughout the night. These breaks in light actually give birds an opportunity to reorient themselves and return to their normal uh, migratory behavior. And using motion sensors essentially do the same, result in the same the thing as the setting a timer like that. The image on the right uh, kind of summarizes the tactics that I've gone over. Um, ideally, lights would be turned off, only have them on when they need to be on. Use a down shielded light fixture with dim, warm, warm tone light when they do need to be on. Light should also be placed so that they illuminate only the areas that are needed. Um, and in, in addition to helping birds and other wildlife, these, these changes can also actually help lower your energy bill. So added bonus for people as well. Next. And uh, some of you may have opportunities to reduce artificial light in non-residential buildings. So I'll just quickly go over some of this. Um, all of the things I've already mentioned still apply. Some non-residential areas might have lighting on clock faces, gardens, lobbies, atria, advertising, where the strategies to turn off, dim, and downshill can be applied. Um, some other strategies, if possible, restrict use of buildings to daylight area hours. Um, interior lights that must be on, it's better to use task lighting at workstations instead of the ceiling lights to help minimize the light spill. When rooms aren't being used, turn off interior lighting, especially if it's higher than the third floor. And also some non-residential areas use spotlights, um, and as best you can, try to avoid using those during the migratory seasons. All right, the next. So I'm guessing that, you know, as I've gone ran through those, um, you're kind of thinking about the lighting that you have in your life. Um, and so I'll put, I put together a few questions that you can ask yourself. Does the light have a purpose that I need? Is the light illuminating only the area where that where it's actually needed? 
does the light really need to be that bright for its intended purpose? And when do I really need to have the light turned on? If it needs to be on, what can I do to relight its to reduce its light pollution? Um, like I said, we'll send out um, links to all this information. And so now I'll hand it back to Jen uh, for some closing remarks. All right, uh, thank you very much. We do have a couple resources here on the screen but it's really tough to copy down uh, long links like that very quickly. So uh, like Amy said, we're gonna send out a bigger resource list um, and some other information and articles uh, after the webinar. And we'll also have this recorded. So if um, folks couldn't make it to the actual webinar, they can watch it again, or you can send it to your friends. If you have someone in your life with really obnoxious lights, <laughs> you can hopefully convince them about uh, you know getting IDA recommended lighting. There's also local um, folks from the International Dark Sky Association, Starry Skies South. Uh, they have great information as well too, and also host uh, need um like planet and star watching events as well so if you also want to try and do something more than just at your own home or your business or community one thing you can do is um advocate for dark skies and lights out and you could do that with your local municipality your city your county and trying to a dark sky week the local charleston audubon chapter and starry sky south work together to do that last year during spring migration. Um, and that's something you could do in your own town. There's resources on the Audubon's website about that, and we'll send that as well. So if you want to get a dark sky ordinance resolution or proclamation locally, um, there's a lot of kind of pre-baked stuff that's real easy to adapt to your situation. Um, and I think right now we're ready for any questions. If anyone has any questions, you can type it in the Q&A box. Um, and if not, we will just, uh, I guess, call it. Um, let's see. I don't think I see any questions coming in. Oh, uh, looks like, oh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Appreciate it. He said, great presentation. Thanks for doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and just re real quick, I think, if it's the same Bill, um, you know, he started talking to me about this a few years ago. So, you know, the folks that are going, you know, to their to their cities and towns to try to convince them to do something, um, just stay on top of them. You know, um, I just kept on telling Bill to to remind me every single year we've got so many things that we're trying to do: invasive species, you know, native plants, uh, putting up cavity box, you know, nest, nesting boxes for birds. I mean, all sorts of things. And this was new for me. Um, so I, I just looked at the first email that he sent me and it was back in 2021. And, uh, so appreciate him being patient and, uh, we're, we're just now starting to really, um, talk about this, um, as an organization. So I appreciate you all, but, um, you know, just be patient and, and keep at it and hopefully we'll get results throughout the entire state and then beyond. Um, I did want to mention that the local IDA branch is the Starry Skies South and you can find him on Facebook. Awesome. All right. I think that's it. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye, Amy. Bye, Savannah. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.